Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flock Talk. I'm Erin Morgan. And I'm Tom Lewis. And we work for the farmer members of the Ontario Sheep Farmers Organization. This is the fourth episode of our weekly podcast to bring you ideas and insights from fellow producers and other experts in the industry. Each week in the month, we will have a different theme, beginning with research in week one, marketing in week two, education in week three, and the fourth week will be open to topics relevant to the time of year and happenings at OSF. This week, the topic is grazing, and we will be interviewing Bill McCutcheon, a farmer in the Grand Valley area of the province. Welcome, Bill, and thank you for joining us. It's been a few weeks since I've seen you at the International Plowing Match. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been in production, and maybe tell us a little bit about your farm operation and size of flock? Sure. Well, it's great to, uh, great to be here and, uh, and do this with you guys. I have uh, almost got over the plowing match. That was quite an endeavor, for sure. But uh, great to see you guys uh, supporting that. <clears throat> I've had sheep since uh, 1979, so for quite a while. And um, at the present time, I have a flock of about 700 ewes. And there's about 100 of those ewes on an annual um, program, annual lambing program. And the rest are... Uh, accelerated we have about four lambings a year or so out of those ewes i'm just uh north of grand valley so uh we uh we rotationally uh graze those ewes and uh, we also graze uh this summer we graze stalker cattle usually have cows and calves we have about 165 acres of grass that we have uh on our home farm we um we have another farm that we cattle on in the fall like a crop farm so on some aftermath and uh and on uh, well aftermath of um of hayland primarily but also have access to some corn stalks and some uh, cover crops and some of the neighboring farms so you're a busy man yep so have you been grazing on your farm since the very beginning and uh what attracted you to grazing versus a more intensively managed operation well, I'm kind of the guy that doesn't really like uh, iron too much. I think it's the most boring thing in the world to ride around in a tractor all day. It drives me crazy. I'd far sooner work with livestock all day. And uh, as a result, uh, I have a tractor. I have a couple tractors, and uh, but I really don't have uh, cropping equipment and really not interested in that. So uh, we uh, we have grown some crops on this farm. Uh, some grain and some uh, corn silage from time to time, but primarily it's in uh, it's in grass. <clears throat> I've had some fields of grass that have been down since um, about 19, uh, 1999, 1997. Some of this uh, pasture has been down. Uh, certainly a great way to build organic matter in your soils. I uh, haven't had a test done for about six or seven years, but at that time we had about 5% organic matter water holding capacity um it's uh i kind of take pride in uh in taking off a lot of our forage with uh without one drop of diesel fuel uh we didn't do it this year because we had some excess forage we harvested but last year we harvested uh, 165 acres of grass without one uh, drop of fuel and uh with the uh, two species it uh, it works pretty good it'd be pretty hard to do with uh with just sheep you need to um, Need some cattle there as well to uh, eat some of that more fibrous uh, material that's out there. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of clipping. We we uh, we depend on the sheep and the cattle to do that job for us. Interesting. So let's just jump right into the uh, the sheep aspect. How do you how do you supplement your flock's diet? Do you supplement their diet throughout the year or just during the uh, the cold months? So once those ewes are on grass, we uh, we really don't give them anything else but grass. We uh, <clears throat> we fry them with uh, with mineral, and but that's uh, that's really all we get. Um, we do feed uh, some MGA on grass to, um, to uh, so we we've chosen not to use the uh, the cedar, so it's dropped on grass. So I guess there is some supplementation there, but it's really only for a 12 day period to uh, to uh, get those ewes cycled. We find uh, nutrition in the grass that they don't need anything else. 
and that they carry enough uh, body condition. So those used are uh, rotationally grazing. Uh, we try and get a grazing intensity uh, of 200 used per acre when we graze. So uh, we put them into a uh, into a paddock and try and remove that material in um, two to three days. Usually the rule is uh, no more than three sleeps, three sleeps on the same ground, and uh, then we move them move them on. We um, like I say, we do uh, graze cattle as well. So we try not to go back on the same ground, um, back-to-back sheep. We try and have a, a graze of cattle in between or two grazes of cattle in between or, or cut a hay crop um, in between those grazing so that we can reduce the uh, pears in those pastures. And how about in the colder months, Bill? Do you, uh, do you supplement them in the colder months? So... Um, we are on an accelerated program, so uh, we have a flock of ewes that will start lambing about the uh, 25th of uh, January. So once we run out of beer, um, we will pull those ewes into the barn. So usually 1st of December, 15th of December, depending on what the conditions are like, we'll bring those ewes in and, uh, and get them sheared. So <clears throat> we do have uh, corn silage and haylage. And we have a TMR mixer. We make up a ration for them, uh, for those ewes. Um, <clears throat> the only way a ewe gets in the barn is if she gets pregnant. So um, we just uh, actually pulled ewes off grass yesterday that are due to start lambing on Monday. Um, so those ewes will lamb inside and we'll wean those lambs around uh, Christmas time or in the new year. And uh, those ewes will go back outside. Uh, so they'll be dry lotted in a in a uh, yard in the field, and we'll drop feed to them. Um, we probably will not have pasture by the first of January, it depends how much snow there is. But uh, this year it's been a pretty good year to stockpile grass. But usually they're in a dry lot. Um, this year we did have grass pretty early. We had those three real warm days in the middle of April, so that was nice uh, getting them out. So. Yeah, we're only without uh, feed here for maybe three, three to four months, uh, like without grass. So that's uh, that's kind of nice. It certainly limits the amount of manure you spread because you've got those sheep outside. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what we do. We we'll have a we have a flock of ewes that will lamb. Uh, like I said, the end of January. Then we have our annual lambing ewes. I actually lamb them in March and then put them to grass with their lambs. The um, the textile use, so there's about a hundred uh, textile use that we lamb in. They're lambs whenever we have grass. When I've grass till about the fifth of May here. We're a little cooler here. I'm up in uh, Dundalk Highlands, so our elevation is almost 500 meters. So uh, we are probably a good week or 10 days behind maybe what you people would see in Guelph for grass. So our, our grazing season is a little bit uh, delayed, but certainly we can take that on into the fall, depending on how much uh, moisture we have. And um, we uh, we do supply water to these use on grass. Um, this time of year, I'm not sure how necessary it is, actually, because the weather's pretty cool, the dews are pretty heavy, and uh, the, uh, the dogs are probably eating, drinking more water than the ewes are, I would think. So you've you've talked about the grazing season. You've talked about pasture throughout the year. Um, you've you've spoken about the winter months and rotating pastures. When talking about sheep out in pasture, predation is certainly an issue. And do you want to maybe speak to us about um, how you manage predation? Yeah, um, predation's always a problem. Uh, seems to be. Um, I do have some dogs. They're probably not as good of dogs as they could be. Not a great, I'm uh, not a great dog guy, uh, but I do have some dogs. Llamas in the past and we've had donkeys and we will um, use a, a fair bit of net if we do have pressure. I've seen that to divide the pastures. It seems to, um, seems to deter the coyotes. They don't want to seem to cross that mesh, which is a good thing. And um, uh, depends how desperate we get, I guess uh, we, uh, after you've worn a shirt for three or four days out there, we do hang it on the fence so that we put scent around. And um, 
if I get really desperate, I'll uh, go to the local drugstore and buy a pack of uh, the stinkiest wood I can find. Usually Axe is good. And we'll go around and paint uh, fence posts with that and try and put scent around. Um, and uh, yeah, the girls at the, at the uh, drugstore didn't know they sold coyote repellent, but they do. <laughs> I can't wait to tell my 15-year-old son that what he's wearing is coyote yes. repellent. <laughs> yes, well, he'll feel safer. <laughs> I, 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 I can see a new commercial for, uh, yeah, for that. Absolutely. Making. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's... Um, Coyotes are pretty smart, and um, it's uh, <clears throat> it can be a little challenging because we usually run at least two flocks. They're not all one flock, so it um, it uh, can be challenging. Um, you think you've got the problem solved in one flock, and they start killing another flock, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an ongoing battle uh, with coyotes. So here. with sheep grazing in your area, I'm assuming you've had to take advantage of the uh, wildlife predation program. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They know me. They know me there. I've written uh, quite a few letters of justification once I hit my limit. Yeah. I guess for me, and and you know, not just me, lots of other producers have uh, have quite a bit of exposure because when I put ewes out, I don't bring them in at night. Uh, they're out. Uh, so once those ewes uh, went out on the fifteenth of April, um, they're out. And uh, we bring in ewes that are uh, pregnant. We breed ewes out there. We um, raise lambs out there. So uh, I don't really, not very often do we give in uh, and house ewes at night. Um, we, we have when things get real intense, but usually it's not, uh, not by practice for sure. Uh, so there's lots of exposure every night. There's lots of exposure um, to predation and uh, and um, so I think that's, you know, part of the thing with the compensation program is the, the people have to realize, uh, you know, that every night we've got 700 ewes out there, plus, uh, you know, baby lambs that, um, they're, that are at risk. So, Bill, when you're selecting your animals, what are you looking for sort of when you're, uh, when you're selecting your genetics? What types of animals are you looking for on your farm? What types of uh, traits are you looking for for um, living out on pasture? Well, I don't know if it's any different than living inside. I mean, they have to be able to uh, have to be able to flock, and they have to be able to uh, to handle the flock pressure and maintain uh, body condition. So, uh, you know, use that uh, use and, and particularly rams that can't do that. We get rid of them. Uh, because they don't really fit with the program and um, they probably eliminate themselves from the flock because they're not very productive. People that are going from, you know, totally confinement situations to doing some grazing may, uh, may find some animals that don't compete particularly well. Um, there's still competition in the barn, I mean, for feed. I mean, when we lay feed down, everybody's shoulder to shoulder at the bunk and um, but we try and group them by by age and by size so that you know they can compete. But I don't I don't know. I mean I'm not sure we do anything special. Maybe we've been grazing so long that I forget what we did. <laughs> and I would think that you know there's lots of opportunities out there for producers in Ontario to take advantage of some grazing. Um, I was going to say with the advent of cover crops. Um, <laughs> It really hasn't been an advent of cover crops. I had lots of cover crops when I was a kid in the 70s. <laughs> and we didn't call them cover crops. We called it feed. So uh, just so you know, uh, the cash croppers did not invent cover crops. <laughs> cover crops have been around for a long, long time. And uh, I think there's some seasonal advantages that we could, as an industry, could take advantage of and, and do some grazing. Um, because I think that... Um, Cash cropping by itself with livestock is not sustainable. And I think we need each other uh, from that standpoint. And to be able to, uh, this time of year, graze some red stands of red clover or graze some, uh, you know, mixes with oats and turnips uh, or um, radish in it, I think uh, I think are all good. I think the technology is a lot better now than it was 20 years ago to use uh, flexing that out there and use... Uh, portable water systems and uh, solar systems to um, charge that fence up. And um, 
it can be done at a uh, pretty low cost. So I think there are opportunities there, even if you are, um, uh, you know, a total confinement flock without any grazing land in the fall on even your own farm, you have all kinds of grazing opportunities that you can't otherwise capable or uh, capitalize on without having livestock. Uh, you know, even if there's an aftermath of a wheat field, you know, that gets to be six inches high, you're likely not going to go out and cut that mechanically because it wouldn't pay. But you could put a group of ewes out there or cattle or whatever and um, and graze that off and um, get some pasture days and and uh, do something good for the soil. So I think it's a it's a win win whether you're doing that on your own farm or on uh, on somebody else's farm. And um, I don't know, particularly with corn stalks. I mean, I graze sheep on corn stalks. Um, it, uh, I think it maybe makes more sense with cattle, with cows, because they'll handle more fiber. But either species can graze corn stalks. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of acres in this province that are plowed down every fall or worked down mm -hmm. and not grazed. And I think uh, both on the on the sheep side and on the beef cow side, we're missing a huge opportunity to capitalize that resource because uh, they certainly do that in other places in North America, but we don't seem to do that here very well. Mm -hmm. It is a great opportunity. So um, earlier you touched on parasites and hmm. uh, what is your strategy to manage parasites? So uh, we were having significant parasite issues uh, Oh, about uh, 10 years ago, and and um, and the uh, anthelmintics we were using were not working. Not that we'd used a whole lot of them, but but they certainly weren't as effective as they uh, used to be. So um, we have a fairly large flock, and, and my opinion is is that um, large flocks evolve. Large flocks will. Um, you know, eliminate genetics all by themselves, and I'm talking. You know, part of it's by natural death, and uh, part of it's by uh, you know you call those ewes that uh, that can't hold body condition, and either they're not competitive enough, aren't aggressive enough, or there's something that's happening that causes them not to have body condition, and that could be parasites. So I think over time in larger flocks, uh, there's enough flock pressure that you eliminate those genetics that are more uh, susceptible to parasitism. So that, that's part of it. And I mean, the other part is, is that we did break that grazing cycle with cattle. Is that, um, as I mentioned, we try not to go back to back fields with, uh, with sheep, if we can help it. Um, it doesn't always happen, sometimes we do. But uh, we try and get a graze of uh, cattle in between those rotations. We usually have four to five rotations on, on grass every year. So um, uh, we have had, uh, usually have 80 pairs, 80 cow-calf pairs out there. So uh, it's amazing how much fiber a cow will eat. And, um, and I think when we manage pastures, it makes the management a lot easier if we have both species, especially if you're dedicated to not taking that product for feed. There's some product that gets pretty fibrous <clears throat> and um, you just don't like that much fiber where a cow is... Um, she really doesn't care. As long as she's full, she'll eat all kinds of fiber. So it, uh, it's a good combination. So that's that's how we handle the parasite issue. I mean, this um, we had one you die early in the spring uh, with parasitism. Uh, we treated her and she died anyways. And uh, used like that, we don't shed many tears over because we think they're better out of the gene pool anyways. Mm -hmm. um, we have not treated use for parasitism this summer, which is... Um, which is kind of surprising um, when you think about how much moisture we've had and how much opportunity there's been for parasites to proliferate out there. Um, we've been uh, we've been okay. We've been okay for parasites. So uh, I think we've got uh, the loads uh, pretty low on the pastures. I guess that's what would that's what that tells me. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't taken fecal samples because we didn't feel a need because we didn't think we had ewes that were very wormy. <clears throat> when we uh, when we do worm, we only try and worm about a third. If we think we've got issues, we'll pick out use that um, we think are um, failing in condition or pale, 
and it does happen from time to time and um but we try not to treat the whole flock at once in helmet okay so we've talked about some of the challenges you've um, you've faced, but um, certainly as a producer and, and grazing, you uh, encountered more. Um, do you want to maybe speak about some of the other challenges you've faced when grazing and um, any advice for new producers considering to pasture their flock? Well, there's always challenges I find with coxy, <clears throat> coccidiosis in lambs. And that's, uh, in my opinion, that's usually because you're not moving moving them fast enough. Uh, we try and move our ewes with baby lambs faster than our dry ewes. So we try and give them uh, fresh grass every uh, every two days instead of every three days. Um, probably daily moves are, are better. Um, it gets to be a lot of fence. That's the only thing, a lot of moving a fence because um, we do use mesh around the baby lambs. Um, <clears throat> our Rito ewes, we don't put ewes, uh, we don't put lambs out to grass with them. Those lambs stay inside, so it's the Texel ewes that go out with their uh, with their young young lambs, and um, and we move them around. So, um, and this thing about shade, uh, a friend of mine uh, talks about shade, and he somebody asked him uh, how he provides shade, and his answer was one word, and the answer was clouds. So that's how we provide shade is with clouds, because um, it. It may get hot here, I guess, but you know, on a, on a when you look at how hot things are in the rest of the world, we really don't get that hot. And uh, if we have ewes that are are suffering from uh, heat stress, you got the wrong ewes. Uh, we should not have that problem in this kind of environment. I feel with ewes that uh, or cattle that get uh, heat stressed because it doesn't get that hot. And uh, I find if you can keep those ewes moving through that grass, uh, they don't get heat stress. Um, they uh, they need extra water some days. Um, certainly cattle, not so much sheep, but um, but I think uh, when we try and do things like uh, provide shade, all we do is uh, pile up sheep and uh, concentrate those bacteria and those oasis. In this case, with uh, with coxie, we we concentrate the parasite drop as well and um, i don't think it's a good thing for your grass certainly not a good thing for your for your sheep um, so i think that's the key is to uh, is to keep those uh, sheep moving not let them overgraze uh, the pasture that they've been on and i think it's far more important to look ahead than behind uh, it's far more important to get to grazing and get it grazed than to worry about taking all the grass that's there because when you leave grass it's still there you will get that at some point through the grazing season it's better to move them faster than it is slower uh, because leaving that aftermath there lots of aftermath um, it provides uh, that area for uh, photosynthesis and your plants come back faster because you're not damaging the root system so you need to protect that root system and and keep those sheep moving um it's um it's a little difficult to do with a smaller flock like i said we try and have a grazing intensity of 200 ewes to the acre so if you've got uh if you've got less than 200 ewes it's uh as well it just means you're going to lose your fields are going to be small going to be much smaller and it's uh you're going to be putting up a fair bit of fence um, we use uh, we use three strands of poly on a reel is what we primarily use to move sheep and divide sheep. Um, unless we do have uh, predator pressure, then we'll we'll switch to the flexi net. Excellent. So, Bill, if you had advice for someone looking to get into grazing on their farm, what advice would you have for them? Oh, I mean, just go for it. I mean, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't worry too much much about what. Um, because once you uh, start to graze, um, certain species will, ex certain ones won't. And I mean, I think the easy to start some grazing is with uh, with aftermath, with crop aftermath um, has uh, on their farms. And lots of times you don't even need to plant it. It's just there. So you can get that into that without uh, a whole lot of expense. Um, 
it's always good to have a bit of a perimeter fence. Like, I mean, we have, we have five strand. Before I started raising cattle, we only had four strand of high tensile on the outside. And, uh, but when we started grazing cattle, we put another line on to make sure we kept them where they were supposed to be. So you should have some sort of perimeter fence. It doesn't have to be five strands, but it probably should be three. And uh, just for, for containment. And um, I mean, just, just start. Um, sheep aren't scared of the dark like we are. They don't care whether it's dark outside or it's light outside. And uh, they don't mind having a sleepover outside because they don't know any different anyways. So um, it may be a bit of a challenge, especially if you've got barn raised sheep is that they may tend to bunch up on you a bit. So there may be some adaptation that they're going to have to accomplish uh, there, but they will. Uh, hunger is a great motivator. And especially when you've got ewes in at 200 ewes to the acre, they kind of have to get their nose to the ground and, and eat what's there. And, uh, and that's how you evenly graze pastures. They can't be very selective when you've got 200 ewes to the acre. They've got to get in there and get grazing. And, uh, and <clears throat> you know, they'll... Um, They'll get into a cycle where they know they they need to be moved, and they expect to be moved. Um, you know, every two days or every three days or every day, whatever schedule you think you uh, you might be on. But those ewes will adapt. There's no doubt, and um, it's important to uh, have lots of power on your fence because uh, that's what makes this uh, makes this work. If uh, if you start jumping through fences, you can train them to be pretty bad. In a, in a short period of time. And it's not fun if, uh, if you can't control that flock. So uh, when you go to buy a fencer, if you think you've got a fencer that's big enough, you should buy a bigger one. Yeah. And uh, make sure there's lots of ground rods on it and make sure you've got lots of, uh, lots of shock going in that fence so that you can control that grazing pattern. Well, thank you, Bill. This has been a great conversation and some uh, great advice for producers. And I, I know Aaron and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share with us some uh, information about your business. Uh, no problem. It's um, sometimes a lot easier to talk about than it is to do. Uh, so it may sound kind of simple, but it's uh, it's probably more complex than that. But we've been doing this for a long time and uh, certainly, uh, certainly like grazing sheep. It's um, Saves a lot of uh, stored feed costs, and uh, we think it feeds a lot of labor, saves a lot of manure being spread, and we think it's just a good thing to do for our soils and a good thing to do for the sheep. Amazing. And uh, so thanks, Bill, and, and thanks to everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode on grazing. Join us uh, next week for our next research interview. And if you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe through your podcast app to receive uh, alerts to future episodes. And please share this podcast with your friends. For more Ontario Sheep Farmers content, follow us on social media at Ontario Sheep Farmers on Instagram and Facebook and at Ontario Sheep on X, formerly Twitter, and visit our website at OntarioSheep.org.